Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Forecast, a diary of the lost seasons with Joe Shute in partnership with Bloomsbury. I'm Lucy Jones, and I am a journalist and the author of Losing Eden. It is my great pleasure um, to introduce Joe. Um, Joe Shute is an author, journalist, and weather watcher with a passion for the natural world. He is a senior staff feature writer at The Telegraph, where he writes the weekend weather watch and what to spot columns. Joe studied history at Leeds University and started his career as a trainee reporter on the Halifax Evening Courier before working at the Yorkshire Post as a crime correspondent. He previously wrote A Shadow Above, The Fall and Rise of the Raven, published by Bloomsbury in 2018. He lives with his wife in Sheffield. So I'd like to welcome Joe to the virtual stage. Thank Hi, you, Joe. Lucy. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I've been enjoying Forecast so much. It's so um, rich and textured and, and layered and beautiful and has so many different elements to it. Um, I was thinking how, you know, in some ways it's kind of a love story of you and Liz and, and a love story of you and, and the weather and, and kind of the, the nature of Britain. Um, but there are also elements of a kind of thriller elements almost of, of, kind of what's happening to our, our changing climate, which we'll get on to. Um, Thank you. And yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure to be in conversation with you. Thank so you. Um, just to start things off, I wanted to ask you, where does your interest in weather begin and why did you want to write the book? Big question to begin with. Um, it was, I mean, I've always been interested in uh, nature and the natural world and history, particularly, as you said, I read history at university and uh, I've always loved kind of um, stories and folklore and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, and I guess that's what led me to the weather, really. Soon after I started at The Telegraph, um, and uh, it was about nine years ago now, and uh, my editor at the time um, said to me, uh, she wanted me to start writing the the, the Saturday Weather Watch column. Uh, now, it's a long established column at The Telegraph. Read the people here watching tonight, I'm sure, will know it existed long before me, and it will exist long after me as well. And... Uh, I kind of, I, I, I sort of read it, but didn't know all that much about it. And she gave me a slightly bizarre instruction, which was to write about anything but the weather. And whatever you do, never try and forecast anything as well. And uh, so uh, I, I started sort of, you know, thinking about the weather and stuff. And a few weeks later, it, it became uh, time for my first column. And uh I looked at it was one of those rare weekends where it was just beautiful sunshine all over the British Isles. Apart from there was on the uh, weather map, there was a rain cloud over the Shetland Islands. So I wrote in my column, uh, you know, it was lovely everywhere apart from in the Shetlands where it was kind of, you know, uh, poor shivering Shetland souls. I still remember how I described it. And uh, a few days later, uh, I got a, um, a letter of complaint through. And I was still very junior at Telegraph, just started, and I was kind of like, oh no. And it was sent from a Telegraph reader on the Isle of Unst in the Shetlands. And uh, he very patiently explained to me that he'd only got around to reading my column on the Tuesday, because that's how long it takes for the Saturday edition of the Telegraph to arrive there by boat, and he only gets around to reading it the next day. And he said, contrary to my erroneous reporting, it was a beautiful day in Shetland as well. And uh, he invited me to come up and, uh, and, and see how, how lovely the islands were for themselves. <laughs> and uh, once I got over the kind of terror of this initial complaint, I was overjoyed that someone in Shetland had actually, had actually read it, really. And uh, in terms of um, the idea for the book, that's that's really where it came from you know ever since i've been writing this column the amount of letters i get um from readers um is just extraordinary it's much more than far more than anything else i write which sometimes can be very dispiriting you know when you spend weeks and weeks and weeks doing some big investigation for the magazine or something and uh, just this sort of short thing a few hundred words on a saturday and i've got a stack of hundreds and hundreds i keep them all and try and reply to as many as i can uh, hundreds and hundreds of these letters I, uh, at home. 
And really it was going through those and, and having all these sorts of individual observations of the weather from readers all over the country uh, made me think about, um, you know, how, and often it was people, and it is people writing about how the weather and their memory of the weather is changing in the modern era and what that's doing to the, the nature in their gardens, in their local parks, in their communities and so on. So that really gave me the idea to sort of take that really and try and piece it all together to provide a picture of, of what's happening in, in Britain today. Mm. Which you do so well. Um, and you also, you you delve into why we are kind of so obsessed with the weather and, and how the seasons make us feel in, in so many different ways in the book. But I wondered um, if I could put to you what why you think we in the British Isles are so obsessed with the weather. What 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 is it about, and and what do you think's kind of underneath it? Did you see any patterns of kind of human um, psychology or behaviour that you think might explain our, you know, our real, our kind of national obsession? I think we're so obsessed with it. Uh, firstly, I think it's true. You know, a hundred percent the cliche is true that as Brits we are more obsessed with the weather than most. It's uh, the amount of, particularly in lockdown the last year. You know, the amount of conversations with strangers. Uh, about it and so on. I think it comes down to the sheer sort of variety of weather that we get here. You know, we are an island nation, uh, anything uh, vulnerable to anything that uh, comes our way across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the same with mainland Europe as well. Um, and then obviously, you know, in winter, big sort of polar blasts from, from the far north. And uh, we do have this incredible diversity of weather in this country and I think that's what gets people so um, sort of excited about it really you know that it's always changing there's always something to talk about even a, a day like today I don't know what it's like where you are Lucy but in uh, in South Yorkshire where I am it's been one of those days it looks like sort of the Colombian jungle out there you know with dark storm clouds above and occasional sort of bursts of sunshine and uh, I went I often pick up ideas for my weather column at my local greengrocers where I go to and because uh, that's they only ever talk about the weather there and uh, I went there early on and it was exactly the same today. <laughs> yeah I'm in Hampshire and it's been very tropical it feels so humid and, and, and quite quite alarmingly so and of course um, there is you know this this backdrop of of alarm and um the loss of as you say of the variety of, of seasons and weather um that we are experiencing um and i wondered of all the seasons and, and the elements that that go with them that we are losing um as the weather changes which matters to you the most i suppose it's the you know, I talk about that diversity of weather we have, um, and I suppose it's the the sort of loss of that diversity, in a sense. And let me explain, because in some ways, you know, we're getting increasingly extreme weather. So in some ways, you know, at any given time, the weather can be doing something completely different that it hadn't been doing previously. You know, records are being broken constantly. But that sort of diversity set against the rough backdrop of the year where you can you could loosely expect what the weather was going to do at any one time in the year I suppose it's that but also and I'm, I'm really keen to to explain this in my weather columns and, and in the book as well that you know it's there's so much of our understanding of the weather is about nostalgia and our childhood memories of it and so much of that can't be trusted we all sort of rely on our kind of we all have you know perfect idyllic childhood memories of long summer days and snow days at school where you know the throwing snowballs you don't have to go in at all and you know particularly for me I always think of sort of lovely autumn mornings and scuffing through I grew up in London and scuffing through uh the the trees of, of London plane trees on the way to school and stuff the, the leaves that were littering the floor and uh, we sort of forget everything that happened in between and our, our minds play tricks on us you know so we forget all the damp dreary days and all the warm winters and all the uh you know the kind of washout summers um our summer months july and august are some of the rainiest months of of the calendar year um and what i'm really keen what i tried to do with this book is to 
understand that nostalgia, sort of delve into that a bit of where that comes from and what how we apply that to the weather and then sort of follow through nature really the signs of how actually the weather was changing um there's a science called phonology which uh, is uh, the science of sort of you it's how you follow the passage of the seasons through nature and that's what i try and do in the book i go back to my crime correspondent days as a sort of detective searching for clues and uh, it that's really what tells you what the changes are you know when the first um leaves come into bud or when the first flowers of uh, a certain plant emerge when the first um, insects hatch and when the first when the birds mate when summer migrants like swifts and swallows uh first arrive um and it's through monitoring that that really gives us evidence of exactly how the changes are impacting on nature um and that's really what 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 the book is about and you mentioned plane trees there and i think there's um there's an anecdote, a story in, in the book about the plane trees at the Cenotaph, which is very uh, illuminating. I wonder if you could could talk about that. Um, I think it, yeah. it, it describes what, what's happening really well. So, so there's a um, uh, there's a uh, one of the, the main phonologists in Britain is a guy called Tim Sparks. And he's um, uh, he used to run the Woodland Trust uh, Nature's Calendar Project, which is uh, currently the largest phonological network in Britain. It has millions of records and, and volunteers sort of uh, giving them um, uh, evidence of this stuff sort of every day. Um, Tim did a, a particular study on uh, the plane trees at the Cenotaph. Um, people watching this will, will know there's a, a long avenue of, of plane trees that runs uh, along Whitehall. Um, and uh, what Tim did is he got pictures together of basically 100 years of um, uh, Remembrance Sundays uh, at the Cenotaph um, and looked at what the leaf fall was doing on the trees and he, he's shown me the pictures you can see a clear pattern of uh, the trees being increasingly green increasingly in leaf um, and uh, certainly one of my jobs for, for the Telegraph for a very long time almost as long as I've been writing the weather column in fact is to cover Remembrance Sunday at the Cenotaph um, and uh, when I contrast my own experiences of being there, particularly now, um, it's whenever there's the two minute silence, it's a common uh, sound and sight for ring neck parakeets to be flying through what are increasingly, you know, very green trees. And some of these photos that, uh, that Tim has shown me, it's the royals on the, on the balcony, you know, swaddled in furs and, and the trees with not a single leaf on them. So yeah, it's exactly stuff like that that shows us um, how it's changing and also how that impacts on us as well, you know, how that changes our own perception of the ceremony and, 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 and yeah. I was fascinated to read about um, the, the cuckoo fairs and the, the London's frost fairs. Um, I thought that was really interesting and, you know, I wonder how, um, how we might celebrate the changing weather in the future. Um, can you just give us a bit of a, a kind of overview of, of how the weather has changed in the last half century or so, um, or, or century in the British Isles? Could you just kind of sum it up for us a little bit? Yeah, so I'm in Sheffield where I live, there is actually one of the oldest weather stations in the whole of Britain. Um, and it first came into operation in 1882 uh, off the top of my head. And uh, it was um, built by the Sheffield Corporation, as it was then, um, to, they'd seen a big sort of outbreak of various very unpleasant bacterial diseases among the sort of uh, working class population of the city. And they wanted to see if there was some way that the weather might be linked to this. Um, so they built this weather station to take uh, uh, four times daily records of uh, rainfall, um, snow, you used to get a lot of snow then, uh, uh sunshine as well and uh, it was it was run by a guy called elijah howarth and he was the curator of a local museum there and uh, he very quickly became known elijah the prophet because he had this amazing ability to tell people what the weather might be doing day after day which was obviously a very new uh science back then um and it's been in continuous operation from then until now so it, it was uh, I went there and, and had a look through the records and, and spoke to 
the current curator of the museum who's been doing Elijah's job for um, the last uh, 20 years or so. And he um, he kind of explained it. And it's, it's definitely worth saying that over that data set, what it shows is the weather always changes. You know, this idea that we've always had four perfect seasons, as I said, is a, is a fallacy. And you have, when you look at a pattern over a century, you have uh, drier, decades and then rainier decades and it sort of dips and ebbs and flows with you know the jet stream and everything else um but in the last 50 years what the records show is that without a doubt temperatures are getting warmer and even though overall we may not be getting more rainfall what we're definitely getting are more periods of extreme rainfall um so at that weather station in the last 40 years They've had double the number of uh, days of extreme rainfall that they had in the previous in the um, over the whole century before that, um, if that makes sense. And uh, I think there's one year really which really sums up where those changes are taking us, which was 2019 in Sheffield. Um, that year was the uh, in July was the 50,000th day of um, recording at that weather station. Uh, it also happened to be the first time ever that they went through a whole winter without recording a single um, bit of settled snow um, over the course of the whole winter. And contrast that with, um, there's some early photographs of the weather station. It was, it's in a, a beautiful Victorian park called Western Park, uh, where there was a fountain there and it would get so cold, cold that the whole fountain would freeze. Um, that year was also the hottest uh, day ever in Sheffield recorded. It was um, 36 degrees, I think. Uh, and it was also the uh, wettest year ever in Sheffield. And that November was uh, the wettest November ever. And um, people watching might remember that for um, uh, Fish Lake in Doncaster, where there was terrible flooding that year. I covered it for the Telegraph, in fact. And uh, uh, that was all that rainfall running down the River Don and, and, and yeah, sort of flooding communities around it. So, yeah, I mean, that that's how it's changing. Heat waves are becoming more likely. Um, snowy winters, sadly, because I love snowy winters, are uh, becoming increasingly rare. There was a, a, a study uh, released by the Met Office uh, a few months ago, which said by 2060s, in most parts of England, certainly, apart from the sort of high uh, northern regions, snowfall is going to be um, uh, increasingly unlikely. Um, and uh, yeah, but, you know, there's a, there's a sort of bleak picture out there. But what I really try and do in the book and what I've always tried to do in my weather columns as well is never sort of make it a kind of, um, you know, just doom mongering about climate change because we get so much of that everywhere. And uh, it's... Um, I always try and strike a sort of message of hope because there are hopeful things uh, that we can do. And uh, I, I hope I give some examples of that in, in the book as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I, I, hope it's, I hope it's a hopeful book for people uh, who read it or have read it. Yeah, I was going to ask you about your, it's interesting that Forecast is a book about um, climate, but, but you don't use the word climate very much. You, you are, rather use the word weather and um some people are nervous that a kind of a focus on climate can um miss the fact that climate change climate the climate crisis is a symptom not not the actual disease and i wondered whether it was a conscious decision for you not to use the word weather more than the word climate what, how, what your thinking are about those words yeah and that, that's a very good point as well and it, it and it what it was certainly um what i wanted to do in the book because climate change is is a very sort of loaded term and it's a very abstract term as well for me it is as well you know you, you, climate change you think of something it's in our nature to think of it as something that happens elsewhere and certainly the more kind of extreme examples we're seeing around the world um, are, you know, it's, it's, it's most fierce in places like the Sahel in sub-Saharan Africa uh, or in the increasingly sort of warm Arctic and so on. Um, but I wanted to kind of obviously not avoid that in the book, but really narrow the lens on um, how it's changing our weather in Britain and how in turn that weather is disrupting seasonal patterns and affecting nature. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was definitely a um, it was definitely a, a conscious decision. I think it was very effective. Um, 
your the pieces about um where you visit people and communities who are um whose lives have been devastated through flooding um was it really kind of brought it home to me that that there are lots of people in, in, in the British Isles who are really living on the front line of climate change. You, know, you often think about wildfires or you know, the situation in, in Canada at the moment. And, and in the book, you even talk about, you interview um, people and, and they don't see the events as close to home as being caused by climate change. And I wondered if, if, if you could talk about that, that there does seem, even though you know, th these events are climate change. We don't talk about them quite yet as they are. From So I started as a journalist 15 years ago. And as you said, at the Halifax Evening Courier was my first uh, paper. And uh, it's in, uh, some people watching may know the area, it's in the Calder Valley, um, which is a beautiful uh, part of the Pennines in West Yorkshire, um, and is also home to uh, some of the, the towns that are most susceptible to flooding now places like Hebden Bridge, uh, Mytham Royd, um, Sorby Bridge where I lived as well and uh, as, a, as a young trainee journalist it was um, always my job there was flooding every year and because I actually lived in the valley and lots of the other journalists lived up in in Halifax and it was all and I had a bicycle so often the roads would flood and you couldn't actually get through to, to, to the places and my news editors would always ring me up and send me off on my bicycle, sort of sloshing through these <laughs> roads to go and meet poor people who have been flooded out. And I've covered so many floods over the years for there, the, the Yorkshire Post and the Telegraph. And, you know, there is always such a dire situation. My heart always goes out to whoever it's happened to because, you know, just everything is washed away and everything is sort of, of deluged. Um, on your point about you know not necessarily attributing it to climate change i think that's in our nature in a way it's easier to think of it as something else you know it's it's much easier to think it's because the rivers weren't properly dredged or uh, i went to a flood in wainfleet in lincolnshire a couple of years ago where uh, not the telegraph but the daily mail were running a story they'd had record rainfall in 24 hours and the village had flooded and uh, they were saying it's because of badgers digging holes in the riverbank. And people seized on that because it's something, you know, we can, it's easier to sort out if it's that uh, rather than the alternative. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, something tangible. Um, yeah. I wanted to talk to you about nostalgia because I think that's really interesting. I was fascinated to, um, I'm just going to read from, from the book. You write, to modern minds, the idea of the four seasons in Britain may seem sacrosanct, but in fact, spring as a defined period did not come into general use until the 16th century, autumn even later than that. Um, I thought that was so interesting. And I mean, flux and, and change are the rule of, of life, as, as you've kind of already talked about. And I wondered whether you feel a kind of urge to kick against um, these changes or whether you feel more resigned um, or whether you see anything kind of redemptive in the frightening changes that are happening um, yeah how, how you kind of how you make sense of it I am uh, I don't know if you are as well Lucy but I think it's a particular scourge of any writer is that we're very susceptible to nostalgia and uh, you know, it's, it's part of what we do. We, we sort of dig into ourselves and uh, our experiences and our past for, for stories and ways of explaining um, uh, the, the, the present. And uh, I've, I've always been terrible for nostalgia. And uh, I, I write in the book this, our, our sort of a second national sport after football as well, because I think as a country, we're, uh, we, we do it very well. Um, certainly, I try and... Um, move on from that in the book and sort of as I've said a bit already you know um, to try and uh, show the reader that the our ideas of those four seasons is a relatively new concept um, and that surprised me in my research as well so uh, for the Anglo-Saxons they only had two seasons they had uh, a kind of six months of lightness and six months of darkness um, and it was similar for the Vikings as well and actually our sort of modern idea of these th these four seasons really came about in the uh, in the 18th century there was a book uh, written by a guy called James uh, Thompson the seasons um, he was also the guy who wrote uh, rule Britannia as well 
and he uh, it was a, a quartet of books that were incredibly popular they've been one of the best selling books ever in 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 the english language and, and continuously printed ever since he wrote them and he really it was it was a period where we were just coming out of something called the little ice age that in the uh, in the 17th century particularly sort of bit hard uh, and temperatures actually went down by two degrees over the course of a century. Uh, and it led to all kinds of uh, havoc, um, you know, failed harvests. You've mentioned the frost fairs on the Thames and the, the, the River Thames would regularly uh, freeze over um, and uh, all kinds of political instability and so on. And then in the 18th century, we started to have this more settled period of weather. And we, really, we kind of seized upon that as uh, you know, uh, as a kind of defining part of our nation state. And that really was the advent of weather watching as well. Suddenly people all over the country, the likes of Gilbert White and so on, would suddenly be keeping their own weather diaries and linking that into the, the passage of the year and the rural armagnacs and everything else. Um, so yeah, it's a, um, it's, it's, it's a sort of recent thing. And um, it may be sacrosanct in our minds, but in terms of actually um, the natural world, not so much, like you say, but everything's always in flux, really. Mm. You meet so many interesting people and you go to so many interesting places um, from hanging out with Norman Aykroyd in, in Bermondsey to you know, traveling to Lake Chad and then the Brex. Um, I learned so much from your, your travels that you shared with us. And I wondered if um, what the, the meetings or the encounters uh, or, or the trips that you went on, which, if you could maybe share one or two that have really kind of stayed with you or, or, or stuck in your mind. A bit like um, my last book, my Raven book, I wanted this to be a journalistic book above all else. Um, and, um, you know, as I regularly say in my columns and, and have done in the book as well, I'm no sort of climate scientist. There are far better minds than <laughs> mine to actually tell people about the, you know, the science behind all this. But what I am good at is uh, you know, going out and talking to people and finding out their own stories as well. So I, I tried to include as much of that um, in the book as possible and uh, talking to people about how, um, what their experiences of, of the weather and, and, and nature's um, changing. Uh, in terms of um, places I went to, um, ironically, if you mention all those travels, it was actually a place very close to home um, in the Peak District and a, um, a farmer called John Elliott, who uh, he, he farms um, various tracts of land um, around a village called Hathers Edge, um, which is only um, a couple of miles from me, really. And uh, I came across John on a, I was cycling in the Peak District and cycled past a field and it was haymaking time in summer. And he was out uh, with um, his four children who were aged from about 20 down to about 11. And each one of them had their own tractor and uh, they were all sort of driving along, cutting up the meadow grass. And these um, swifts were above them, following them like a cloud as they went, diving down and, and gobbling up the insects as they were rising up from the sort of whirling tractor blades. And it was just such a sort of perfect scene uh, that I stopped and, and, and went into the field and introduced myself and said, you know, I'm interested in nature and the weather and love to talk to you a bit about what you're doing and so on and he was a lovely hospitable man invited me to his farmhouse um a week or so later and uh just told me his stories and his um he 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 spoke with such a kind of knowledge you know these a, a farmer like that whose family go back hundreds of years they've always presided and protected this bit of land and he really farms in the old ways as well you know he refuses a lot of the sort of modern techniques, refuses to spread slurry on his fields, for example. Um, he has some ancient hay meadows, which are uh, a, a vanishingly rare habitat now. And he he um, keeps them perfectly, just cuts them once a year and lets these beautiful flowers grow again. Um, and, and the year that I met him was a record drought in the Peak District. And uh, those meadows were turning yellow and uh, he was worried about not having enough winter feed for his cows. Um, and Lady Bower Reservoir, which is um, his, some of his land overlooks, uh, the, the, the water there, re, um, people watching may know, it was the big reservoir in the Peak District where the dam busters practiced their bouncing bombs before 
uh, doing the, the the World War II raid, and the, the the water there had gone down to such a level that there was a flooded village that was there when the um, reservoir was created, and, and the old ruins of, of of that village were starting to poke through the water. It became a sort of weird climate tourist attraction, um, and having a man like John explain that he'd never seen anything like this meant so much more to me than you know someone on tv doing it or someone like myself doing it because he lives and breeds it he sees those seasonal patterns uh with a closer eye a microscopic eye compared to you know any of the rest of us um so really it was him and and those encounters just a few miles from uh, my house that left the biggest mark on me i guess mm. um i wondered how People like John Elliott and those you, you met who, are, who, who live very close to the land. Um, and I mean, even yourself, you have so, you notice so much and, and you kind of you kind of take keep this diary of, of the things that um, the other non-human beings that you, that you notice and you see and, and, and the changing patterns. I mean, do you have a sense of um, does someone like John Elliott have kind of eco anxiety? It's a term that people talk about quite a lot. Um, I mean, is that something that you came across in your in your travels um, with people at the front line as well? Or do you think that's a useful term? Uh, for someone like John Elliott, I would say no. I'd say he's not a man who would uh, easily talk about his anxieties in that sense. And I think in a way, I do think the, the, the use of the word can sort of, you know, I'm, I'm always wary of phrases like that because we can, you know, it can sort of cheapen an experience and it can you know, it can become a sort of a fashionable thing to say, you know, and that immediately lose it, it loses its sort of power of what's actually happening. Um, certainly what I did see um, in the Calder Valley um, was uh, they were having such repeated floods there that as well as when the, the, the flood sirens sounded, as well as sending flood wardens and fire off um fire brigade down there they'd also uh send um uh, specialist trauma teams as well um and they coined a phrase which i'd never heard before i wrote a feature about it for the telegraph actually called which was environmental trauma and that people were experiencing this stuff repeatedly over time um so yeah certainly experienced in relation to that mm, that's fascinating i'm uh, i'm aware of the time so it, um audience if you have questions do pop them in the um the chat box um but i want to talk to you before i pass the mic um about hope which you which you've mentioned and i wanted to ask well there's a there's a phrase in in your book which has really stayed with me since i i read it which was um you imagine future generations saying could you not see what was coming um, which I think is a, a, a really powerful line. Um, and I wanted to ask you how you think, it's a big question, Joe, I'm afraid, but how, how do we mend our broken relationship with the land? Um, and I suppose another way of putting it is where, where do you see hope? Mm. I, I see hope. I, I really do see, I'm a natural optimist, but I also, I really do see hope everywhere. And, and as I've said already, I hope I reflect that on, you know, all the way through the book. Um, hope in, 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 in character individuals who, and in, like I say, all the letters I've been sent um, from, from readers of people, you know, we all, this stuff means so much to us. And we all, um, you know, we, we focus it, we monitor it, we study it, we talk to each other about it. It's not something that, you know, it's, it's something that is, is we're, we're sort of documenting as it happens um and secondly hope that um we can there are instances that i came across in the book and, and report about where we can change this this stuff as well um an example i give in the book i'll, I'll quickly mention now it was on uh, saddleworth moor um and uh you'll remember in 2018 it was the uh biggest wildfire there in living memory a thousand hectares burnt and i've covered it for the telegraph i was in london that day and sent up on a train as soon as the first plume of smoke emerged and kind of got there with all the the rest of the press pack and uh, it stuck in my mind then because we were given surgical masks to wear because all the kind of old chemicals in the in the peat were, were being released in in the air and uh, it was obviously pre-covid and i thought how strange it was doing interviews while wearing a, um, a mask which is something i've got uh, far more used to in the past 18 months um and uh 
I, I, it was obviously, you know, a devastating fire, but I, for the book, I went back a year on, um, went back to the same bit of land uh, and to see, you know, what it looked like a year on. And uh, I went to uh, the edge of the fire and it was where, where the fire had stopped was um, where conservationists had been working to re-wet uh, the, the moors. They were drained over the second half of the 20th century. Um, and in doing so, it sort of made it more vulnerable to wildfire. Uh, and uh, so what they're doing is sort of, and it's happening all over the Peak District and, uh, and, and beyond as well, you know. And uh, they're planting um, these sort of mosses, uh, sphagnum moss into the, uh, into the peat. And they act as a giant sort of sponge. And you could see they're beautiful as well, sort of emerald green star shaped. Um, and you could see this really clear line where the, the fire had met the moss and it had stopped. And uh, on the other side, this kind of moor that had already been rewetted was, was perfectly preserved. It was absolutely fine. And on that rewetted moor, not just have they created a sort of natural fire break, but also they're seeing uh, really threatened moorland species um, of birds and insects coming back in, in really impressive numbers as well. Things like golden plover and dunlin and curlew are all um, doing really, really well there. Uh, things like crane fly um, and uh, lots of hares are coming back and so on. So what they've done, you know, by doing that small thing, you're not just sort of creating a, a sort of wall against um, these more likely wildfires that we're going to see you're also sort of restoring the peat into its natural state so it soaks up carbon rather than when it's in a degraded state releases it into the atmosphere and at the same time sort of boosting biodiversity and everything else that brings with it as well um and certainly we're hearing now um from the government if not quite seeing the action yet you know much more talk of natural regeneration and um and you know letting healing the land basically um to sort of mitigate against some of the worst uh, extremes of, of 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 climate change and and that for me was a stark example that there is definitely uh not a need to um lose hope at all you know hope is all around us and and i hope i reflect that you do thank you for that that's a really um that's a really powerful image um I think we're getting to Q&A time, uh, which is exciting. And I, and I think there should be a, um, a poll uh, in the chat box, um, which people can answer if they want. So it's, what is your favorite season? Um, so audience, if you'd like to, to I, wow, I can see the answers coming in in real time. Um, if you'd like Me too, to it's, that, like, it's like watching a horse race, isn't it? It is, and I mean, I, I guess, <laughs> I'm not going to reveal the, the, what looks like the winner yet, but it, I think I probably expected that. And we're going to move on to questions now. So thank you, everybody, for um, for, for uh, asking some questions. I'm going to start with, um, I think it'd be Marcia Collins. Good evening, Joe and Lucy. Joe, I assume you will continue to monitor such changes. And is it likely that you would write a follow up book in perhaps five to ten years? Mm. I, because the changes, I'll definitely continue to monitor them in, in Telegraph, Weather Watch columns and elsewhere. And uh, the changes are good and bad. You know, um, we, we, we obviously talk about it as a, as a negative thing a lot of the time. Um, but what we're seeing certainly in the short term is um, there, there's some um, uh, species that are really benefiting from these warmer winters that we're seeing, for example. So in my garden, things like long-tailed tits, um, gold crest, um, wren are all doing far better than they they, they have done previously. And uh, I mentioned ring-necked parakeets earlier on. They're spreading so far north that the, the flock in Glasgow now is the most northerly flock of parrots in the world. Um, another bird like black caps now are a regular thing in winter. Um, so I think there's, you know, the, these changes, they're not all... Bad. And there's maybe something as a sort of interesting follow up of, of kind of, you know, the the, the unlikely um, beneficiaries of, of, of some of what we're seeing as well. Um, I can't promise another book, but I will uh, definitely keep monitoring them and writing about it. Thanks, Joe. OK, so this is a question from Margaret Barlow. Thanks, Margaret. Um, I'm about halfway through your book 
I am dismayed about all the extreme weather events which have been going on for decades and even centuries, yet we are still talking about it, i.e. the forthcoming climate change summit. Can you foresee any solution? I think we we, we are hearing solutions now. And actually, the um, so even in the time that I've been writing this column, uh, the, the political consensus has changed dramatically. Um, I remember being a, a, a flood um, uh, in uh, in Kent um, in 2013 um, for the Telegraph when David Cameron was prime minister and he turned up in his wellies as politicians always do at floods and kind of pointed at things and got harangued by people who'd been flooded out and so on. But I remember him then. It was a, it was one of these they described as once in a hundred years events is how they sort of categorise floods and it had happened twice in in a couple of years. And 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 Cameron then said, you know, these things are happening with a with a, a greater sort of regularity. And even that then made news. He made the ten o'clock news headlines just for that statement alone. Um, if you compare that to at least the rhetoric of our politicians now on climate change. It's a huge leap, you know, that you won't have any party really that's arguing that um, we don't, we shouldn't do anything about this, you know, it, it's just part of the natural sort of variations. Um, and we've seen with, with COVID um, that we can come together and we can um, address, you know, moments of great crisis. Those moments often bring out um, the best in us and, um, uh, we've also, you know, seen in, in in scientists that they, you know, I'm astounded still, despite having interviewed some of them and written about it, that they can produce these vaccines at the speed they have and get them in so many of our arms and stuff. And, you know, we are an incredibly adaptable and clever, resourceful species. And if we're under threat, which we which we are and that's the you know that's the agreed consensus now then we can devise ways to deal with it as well um so i'm i'm not just hopeful but i'm, I'm actually excited about um the changes we're going to see uh in the next decade or so um you know in 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 sort of in everything you know on on, on the way our streets look on the way our cities and towns look um and uh, yeah i think i think there are sort of bright brighter days ahead for us on this Thanks, Joe. Um, so Margaret Parkins asks, what is the best way to interest the young people in these activities? So when I was writing the book, I actually um, was uh, volunteering for a year at a, uh, there's an estate near me called the Manitop Estate, which is one of the biggest um, and uh, previously one of the sort of roughest estates in uh britain and uh it's got a, a great charity up there that um they actually grow wildflowers and uh and trial out what different wildflower seeds will work for uh, uh being planted in cities and uh across the country they devise the seeds that are planted in the olympic park in london for example were grown up on this estate and uh, i did a, a nature writing project with um some uh, primary school and secondary school kids on the estate um, and we followed the seasons. We, we um, once every fortnight, we met up on a Saturday and we spent a day uh, going out. Um, the idea of it was to show, you know, there's nature everywhere. You don't need to go to the Peak District or you don't need to go to, you know, a park. You can just spend a long time looking at a tree pit and suddenly all this kind of nature emerges. And I was amazed at how interested they were, how, um, uh, knowledgeable they were as well um and uh, and they 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 spoke about sort of um the the kind of anxiety of of of, of the sort of the schooling that they do now you know schooling obviously is a lot of people watching with kids will know there's lots of pressure on them so i think just having a bit of time away from that where they could just focus on something completely different and be given free reign when i was doing it, they could either write it about it or, or draw what they were seeing and just having that sort of free reign to be a bit creative and notice stuff made a big difference and i think like you know kids are brilliant for noticing stuff aren't they um so i that would be my number one advice uh for that doing things like um the big garden bird watch um or uh there's any number of this stuff that and this is all the citizen science that feeds into the the uh, phonology that I'm talking about as well by doing that you're not just interesting kids but you're building a really good uh, sort of um, uh, basis of, of evidence for what's happening as well 
Um, so yeah, that would be my advice. Thanks, Joe. So just on that, the phenology element. So you said the big garden watch. Are there what are the other kind of main um, initiatives that people could get involved in if they want to to, to do citizen science and monitoring? So there's a big garden bird watch in February time. There's a butterfly one as well, um, which is around about now, I think, actually, um, where you can monitor um, what species of butterfly. It, it's lovely because it's always in summer. The garden bird watch, can, the weather can be a bit hit and miss. But this you can sit out in the garden with a cup of tea and you, you count uh, the different species of butterfly uh, you see. Um, one I actually did for the book was, uh, it's called the New Year Plant Hunt, and it's run by the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. And uh, in the first four days of the year, they go out and count uh, the species of flower that are in bloom. And uh, they've been doing it for 10 years now and finding every year more and more species of flower are in bloom. And actually when you go out, and it's amazing, you know, all the botany books will tell you nothing is, is in bloom then. But if you go out, it's it's um, incredible, really, what flowers are emerging. A lot of that's due to warmer winters. Um, but it's a really fun thing to do. They get their first record every year. by They've got some very keen volunteers who always do it by torchlight on the way back from a New Year's party. And uh, if you don't want to do that, it's nice to do it with a mince pie during the day, which is what I did. Sounds great. I'm definitely going to do that. Um, speaking of kind of noticing and monitoring, um, I've got no butterflies in my garden at the moment. It's really depressing. Have you noticed anything this summer? Are you, are you keeping your eye on any particular species and noticing changes? I think um, certainly up here is is how delayed everything is. And that's still sort of finding its way through now. Um, it's kind of ironic that the year this book comes out is we had our frostiest April for 60 years and then that real washout of the May as well. Um, and something, uh, there was an old Thomas Hardy poem from 1918, I think, called A Backward Spring. And we've really experienced that this year where things begin to emerge and then just sort of duck down again. And uh, certainly, you know, that's part of the kind of unusual weather that's, that's sort of feeding into the wider narrative of that. Um, so what I've really seen, yeah, is stuff delayed. But actually, at the moment, that's bringing me so much joy because my... Uh, garden we've had blue tits nesting there um, and they've had a really tough year blue tits this was the first year ever that they didn't appear on spring watch because um, the, the way the weather was was just really disrupted their uh, their their patterns so they um, they didn't have any on camera um, but we've got some in our garden and uh, we've got lots of uh, baby coal tits and sparrows as well and they're all just in the last few days taking their first faltering flights with their parents and uh, completely demolishing our bird feeders. We're getting through, uh, we're having to fill them up sort of once a day, but watching that sort of, you know, what should have happened a few weeks um, previously, watching it, all that happen now is, 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 is really lovely to see. Lovely. Um, we have a question from Jacqueline Murray. Hi, Jacqueline. Hi, Joe and Lucy, very interesting talk. What are the most important steps a family, individual or group can take and who inspires you in this field? Oof. Uh, I mean, important steps is, I've banged on about it already, really, but noticing stuff, keeping a record, you know, keeping your own diaries and, and, and feeding that into wider networks is really useful. And then doing what, you know, anyone with gardens, it's amazing what happens when um, you just sort of leave a bit of it to, to, to grow wild. I keep a bit of my lawn that, you know, just leave it a bit sort of meadowy and stuff. And that's filled with bees and beautiful clover and buttercups and stuff. And uh, so just sort of, yeah, just think, just kind of being, you know, sympathetic. But I'm sure lots of people watching this already are as well um, um, with that. In terms of who in inspires me, um, I mean, the, the great privilege of my job um is you get to go and, and meet sort of experts in their field and um people who are hugely passionate about um uh the, the you know the things that they've studied spent their whole lives studying there's a bloke in the, in the book for example called nigel hand who's one of britain's foremost adder experts and uh he's spent decades monitoring this patch of the malvern hills he wouldn't tell me on pain of death exactly where or wouldn't let me say where it is in the book uh, for fear of people coming and, and, and looking at these adders but he he devotes his life to these snakes he's been bitten by one before 
as well and told me about how he sort of monitored he was sent to go to hospital but refused and, and just sat at home like documenting as his arm gradually turned purple <laughs> and uh, he you know meeting people like that and and sort of unsung in some sense you know he's not you know he's, he's not david attenborough but he in that way is is so passionate and 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 has done so much to sort of not just protect these snakes but also um, raise public awareness of them and and the issues they're facing and stuff so it's it's people like that really i loved that bit about the the snakes it made me think i really want to get out there and, and learn how to be a snake hunter his um, eyes were i mean I'm, I'm interested in bird watching but i've never seen someone who can just detect uh he could do it by sound even like a a, a common lizard he said was sort of pitter patter across the the the, the heather moorland but you hear that the snake is a, the snakes are sort of long singular note and uh i mean i was sort of blundering about but he could just pick these snakes from all over the place it was it was incredible that's fantastic um we've had some really lovely comments coming in um someone has mentioned the maybug stag beetle count um so that that's good to know and we are coming to the end of our time um joe do you want to guess what you think the answer for the the poll question was Favourite season. Uh, How about you tell us what your favourite season is first and then you give it give a guess. My favourite season is autumn, actually. And maybe that's a, a melancholic streak in me. But I love the um I love the 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 sort of sense of everything slowly fading and I love that smell, that crisp, sort of tangy smell. Um and uh yeah, where I live in Sheffield, there's beautiful ancient woodlands right in the heart of the city as well. Um, and uh, yeah, going for a walk through those on an autumn day is definitely my favourite. Um, but I'm going to guess spring. I reckon spring is the season of rebirth and renewal and the one that everyone loves. You're absolutely right. Spring is the winner with um, 63%. Uh, can you can you guess which was the, lo the loser by quite a margin, actually? It's um, quite surprising to me. Is it winter? Yeah. Winter, I only got two votes. Well, after um, the winter we've all just been through, that uh, <laughs> was a bleak one, wasn't it? That's probably true. Well, um, thank you, Joe, so much. And I, I exhort all of you, if you haven't bought it already, buy this book, it's wonderful and really <laughs> clever and really moving and um, yeah, a really important book. So yeah, do get it if you, if you Thanks, haven't already. Thank you again to all of you, uh, Telegraph subscribers, and to Bloomsbury for making this event possible. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you so much to Joe for, for sharing your, your book with us. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. And thank you to all the, uh, the, the people um, watching this who have sent me all those letters over the years as well. Um, I mentioned you in the acknowledgements of the book because really it wouldn't have happened without you. And every letter I get on the Weather Watch column is such a, a treat to read. So please do keep them coming as well. Great. Thank you. Good night, everybody.